All right, guys, greetings. Welcome to the August Sila Foundation webinar, Network Beyond Bias. I'm Cindy Davidson, the Education Trustee for Sila Foundation, and today we're delighted to be hearing from Amy Wanninger. Amy's firm, Lead at Any Level, works with organizations that want to build diverse leadership, bend strength for a sustainable competitive advantage. Amy is the author of multiple books, including Network Beyond Bias, Making Diversity a Competitive Advantage for Your Career. This is exactly the topic you came here to learn more about. I was lucky enough to hear Amy speak a few months ago on this subject, so I've already had a, a little bit of a sneak preview of the kinds of thought-provoking insights you're about to receive. Best of all, I think you're going to learn how to press your pause button. I didn't even know I had a pause button, but I can honestly say it's one of the most useful things I've learned this year. This is definitely a session where you're going to want to make some notes. You will have the opportunity to evaluate the quality and diversity of your own network, and Amy will provide you with some excellent takeaways, tools that will help you upskill into intentional networking, which is something we should all be doing. We have an hour, and although you will all be on mute, sorry about that, we will be taking questions through the Q&A function, and Amy will address them at the end. Please let us know if you're having any technical issues, and we will try to help you out. Also, I need to acknowledge and thank our August webinar sponsor, ExamFX, which not coincidentally is also where I work. <laughs> Silo Foundation recently opened up these webinars to sponsorship. We're super grateful to ExamFX, and by that I mean my boss, for stepping up and helping to keep these webinars free for our attendees. If your firm would maybe be interested in sponsoring a future webinar, there's only two spots left for 2020, so just let me or Mary Ellen Hammock know. And now I'm going to turn this session over to Amy, and I'll be back at the end to wrap us up. So Amy, the screen is all yours. Thank you, Cindy, so much. And I'm going to have to uh, write down what you said so I can make that my intro for everything I do because that was a wonderful introduction. I appreciate it. So I'm curious, and I know we don't have um, the option to hear from people, but maybe if you could just use the Q&A feature as we're going along, I'd love to hear from you. You know, most people, when we think of networking, we think of this guy. And I'm curious, um, how many of you think of this guy? When you think of networking, somebody who's always super glad to see you probably has a thousand business cards he's going to hand out today, um, you know, ready to sell you something and tell you how great he is and very not interested in you and what you have to offer. Um, this was my impression of networking uh, prior to 2016. And when I thought about the first time I ever went to a, uh, an insurance industry conference and I knew there were going to be about 3,000 people there. I was so nervous about networking because I imagined I was going to be in a conference center full of 3,000 of this guy and me. And I was really anxious about it. And it wasn't until I really sat and thought about that for a while and, and sort of did my own, uh, my own self-assessment on how I was going to approach the event that I realized that I'd been networking my whole career. I just didn't call it that. I called it relationship building. But I want to ask you, you know, either in the Q&A or just, you know, for yourself for a moment, why is this topic important to you? What about this topic appealed to you? Um, because you could be anywhere right now. You could be on probably 10,000 other webinars or, you know, getting some work done. And I'm curious, um, you know, what brought you here today? What, what made you set aside time to talk about the concept or to learn about the concept of networking beyond bias. I want to tell you a little bit about why this topic is important to me. So as I mentioned in 2016, I was on my way to the CPCU conference and I'm not in my stomach on the flight. And I decided that instead of do, engaging in the activities that I thought of as quote unquote networking, I would make a game of the conference. And I would try to help three people a day while I was there. And, you know, it got, it was pretty easy to help three people, right? You're around all those people. I found somebody who needed help carrying some stuff that counted. I was able to recommend a book to someone that counted. And I realized as I was going through this, and then as I, um, you know, spent some time throughout the conference, just talking to people, I realized that I was actually pretty good at networking. It just wasn't 
you know, what I thought it was. And something else happened at that conference as well. You know, I went to a lot of different sessions on diversity and inclusion in the insurance industry. Um, I've been to a lot of sessions on diversity and inclusion in other industries as well since then. And what they all had in common for me was that I didn't walk away with anything I could do differently to make a difference where I worked. And that felt um, that felt really uncomfortable for me. And it, I felt like something was missing. And so I set out to answer that question. The question of, yeah, but what can I do? Because I didn't set policy at my company. I was one person in a 35,000, you know, employee organization, um, one very, very, very tiny cog in a very large machine. And I just kept coming back to, yeah, but what can I do? Because I know this is a problem and I want to do something different because I know nothing changes unless I change it. And when I sat down to wrestle with that problem for a while, I came up with um, my book, Network Beyond Bias. And I'm going to share some of this with you today, um, especially kind of the most important thing, which is it matters who's in your network and it matters who you bring into your inner circle. And so I want to make sure that we get into the content, but I wanted to share a little bit about where I came from. Um, because people have asked me, like, why do you care so much? And why I care so much is because, you know, this is something that's always been important to me, but it wasn't until I realized that I could make a change that I really felt like this was something that I should be doing with my time. So this is part of a larger program. I have a, a very deep dive on Network Beyond Bias. It's called the Network on Purpose Bootcamp. Um, but I'm also offering right now um, an Inclusive Leadership Basics Bootcamp. And Network Beyond Bias is the second module in here. It's called Network Like a Champ. It's a little bit different lens. But um, I did want you to know that this is, you know, we can't cover everything in an hour. There is so much more to this. But if this is something that's interesting to you, let me know afterward. And I would be happy to talk to you about how we can, you know, we could work together one on one. You could, you know, enroll in the course or we could um, even bring this program or one like it to your organization. Here's what I know for sure. And you know, as we go through this, everybody thinks that their heart's in the right place. Every single person um, that I've ever met says, I'm a good person. I don't need this kind of training. I'm a good person. I'm not a, you know, I'm not a bigot. I'm not a racist. I'm not sexist. I don't need this kind of training. Or, you know, my heart's in the right place. I don't know what else I'm supposed to do. And I'm here to tell you that your heart can't be in the right place if you never move your feet. And I'm here to challenge you today to ensure that your heart is the, in the right place by actually moving your feet. So let's talk about how we're going to do that. First, we're going to talk about breaking the cycle of unconscious bias. And I have three simple steps for that. And the pause button is one of them, Cindy, you'll be happy to know. And uh, the second part of this lesson is about networking like a champ. Who do you need in your network? Who's missing from your network? And how do you close those gaps? And then finally, how do we include others on purpose? How do we make meaningful connections across differences, even if it's not always the most comfortable thing to do? And so that's what I want you to uh, take away from this today. And let's dive right in, shall we? So what you probably have noticed about your brain, especially now that we are all working from home or have been working from home, if you're not still, um, you know, balancing all of our work and all of our life from the same probably 10 square feet of our house and our brain, um, our brains are not very good at multitasking, are they? It's hard to switch gears. It's hard. I had a, a situation where I was working today and my husband walked in and started asking me questions about you know, whether my kid was grounded over the weekend, I was like, I don't know. I'm not thinking about that right now. Can we talk about it later? Right. The interruptions never stop and it takes a minute, right. To kind of get back into that zone. And so our, our brains are not great at multitasking, but they're really good at sorting. And 
the reason for that is, you know, when we were cave dwellers and we would step out every morning, we had to make really quick decisions about, you know, whether the thing that was approaching was something we could eat or something that was going to eat us and whether the person that we saw approaching us was in our tribe or not in our tribe. These were split second life and death decisions and they had to be made very quickly. So our brains got very good at sorting and specifically sorting into two categories, been there, done that, or that might kill me. And there's really no in between as far as your brain's concerned. You either ignore the thing or you're worried that it's an existential threat. And those are really the first, that's really the first barrier you get through um, in your thought process. Well, this happens 11 million times per second. Can you believe that? 11 million sensory inputs per second, sights, sounds, smells, you know, tastes, um, you know, feelings or you know, whether the environment is cold or too warm or, you know, your chair is comfortable or the lights are humming. All of these things are being absorbed by our brain 11 million times a second. And so we have to be very efficient sorters to know if there's a threat in our environment. Now, that's all well and good. What happens, though, is if something in that 11 million is perceived to be a threat, what happens? Well, our amygdala sends out chemicals into our body that trigger our fight or flight response. We see it a surge of adrenaline and we feel anxious or we feel afraid or we, you know, we maybe change our body language in some way or we prepare to, you know, to flee our situation. We get defensive, whatever the thing is that we do when we feel threatened. But the problem is our, the thinking part of our brain, the cerebral cortex doesn't get 11 million pieces of data to process to figure out what's going on. It only gets 40. There are only 40 bits of information every second that get through that gate of been there, done that, that might kill me. And a third category, which is I need to think about this for a second. And so while your body's busy responding to 11 million, your brain only gets to think about 40. Now, what happens is our thinking is constantly trying to catch up to our feeling. And so you can probably imagine a time when you were driving into work back when we used to do that. And, you know, you got to the office and you realized like you didn't realize most of your commute or you didn't remember most of your commute. Right. We have this sort of we go on autopilot. We don't take everything in. Been there, done that. But if you were, you know, approaching a stoplight and almost hit the car in front of you because, you know, maybe there was a slick spot on the road. What happens, you know, even when it's over and and there was no accident, our heart starts racing, you know, we're really freaked out, right? We have this like surge of adrenaline and you may still, by the time you get to work, feel unsettled, feel rattled and your brain's telling you, oh my gosh, I was almost in a wreck. I could have been killed. I might've, you know, I might've scratched my new car. That car in front of me was a Lexus. That would have been a really expensive accident, right? Whatever the stories are that your brain's telling you to remind yourself or to catch up to how you're feeling. And if you think about it, you know, this happens a lot of times throughout the day. Our feelings are really in control. You know, they're in the driver's seat if we don't actively intervene. Now, all of these feelings, all of the sorting that goes on happens because of our biases. Biases are just preference for or against one thing or another. That's all it is. And our biases are not necessarily something that we're born with, but they start when we're born, certainly. And so while we're hardwired to have these biases, you know, by our physiology, our our, um, physicality of our brains and our bodies, everyone's biases aren't the same because they kind of start when we're born and we're all born a little bit differently. So let's talk about that. Where do these come from? Well, before you were even born, I am almost certain someone asked your mother if you were going to be a boy or a girl. That's one of the first questions that we get when we're having babies. Uh, Almost every woman will tell you this and every woman that's had a baby. And so, you know, anytime we are expecting a new person, we're trying to figure out who they are, right? How do we interact with them? What kind of gifts do we buy? What pronouns do we use to refer to them? And so even before we're born, the environment around us is trying to create an identity for us. And then once we're born, it all gets a lot more complicated because now we're actually part of the equation, right? So it doesn't take long before we start to realize that people, different people interact with us differently. And if you think about that, even newborns, brand new babies, couple days old, 
know the difference in the sensations when they're about to be fed or about to be nurtured versus when they're about to get, you know, a cold sponge or a sharp needle, right? So they start to anticipate these things. They start to process sensory inputs and draw connections between, you know, input and response. You know, and the thing is, like, we're constantly picking up on these cues. Babies as young as three months old already show a preference for people of their own race. And a lot of that has to do with not that the baby has the self-awareness of what their race is or what their the social construct of their race is, but they have experience, three months of experience with how they're treated by different people. And so they start to have a more positive response to people of their own race very early. Now, while all of that's happening and we're figuring out who we are in the world, we're also adopting the values of our family, of our community, of the broader society around us. This is a process called socialization. And what socialization is basically is we have to internalize those values to stay out of trouble. And until we can self-regulate inside those rules, we are likely to be punished. And you think about that for little kids, right? It might mean going to timeout or, you know, getting sent to the principal's office or something like that. But as adults, we have very real consequences as well, right? Our workplace has a lot of rules that we have to internalize lest we be fired. Um, our marriages and other, you know, adult relationships have rules that we need to internalize lest we lose those relationships. So we're constantly, you know, reprioritizing our values to match uh, the expectations of the people around us. We're also, though, actively engaged in judging people who prioritize values differently or who don't share the same identities we do. And I'm using the word judgment very intentionally because we do make judgments like us, not like us. Right. And typically those fall into good person, somebody I need to look out for. Um, but and all of that's fine. That's just part of you know how we how we process the world. But here's where we get into trouble. We tend to choose, at some point, we start to choose our experiences in ways that affirm our identities, align with our values, and reaffirm our judgments about others. And I'll give you just a really quick example. When I was a kid, uh, you probably, if I say gym class, you probably fall on one of, in one of two categories. You were either great with you know, muscular coordination, you know, eye-hand coordination, and, you know, really good at throwing, kicking, catching, or otherwise manipulating a ball in 3D space, right? Star athlete, you were on it, right? Or you were like me and no depth perception. So anything that involved a ball usually involved it hitting your head. And when recess came, you got to choose your experience. You got to choose your own adventure at recess. And if you were one of the star athlete kids, you were probably on the basketball court, out playing soccer, playing baseball, something like that at recess. And if you were like me, you were playing hopscotch or you were reading a book under a tree until you got caught and got sent back out to the playground. So this starts very early, right? Like third grade, I remember, like with a book under a tree at recess. <clears throat> but we don't stop doing that as adults, right? We all choose our experiences, continue to choose our experiences in these ways. And what happens is our world gets smaller and smaller and smaller because we stop interacting with people whose identities are different from ours, who don't prioritize the same values we do, the people that we have maybe some negative judgments about or vice versa. And what happens is we stop realizing we're even making those decisions. And it's when we don't recognize our biases, when we don't recognize these preferences for or against, that they become unconscious biases or what I call default behaviors, where we start to gravitate toward the thing that's the most comfortable right now so we don't have to think about it. Now, you know, I mentioned earlier, you could be anywhere right now, but you're here on this webinar learning how to be more effective in your work and your career. And I'm going to go out on a limb and say that the people around you probably see you as a leader. Because most people who are invested in their own development, either with their time or their money, are leaders, whether they realize it or not. Other people look to them as examples. Other people 
watch them to see what they're learning and what they're doing. So I'm going to just make a blanket statement right now that if you're on this call, you're a leader, no matter what your job title says. And I don't think leaders have the luxury of doing what's easiest or most comfortable in the moment. I believe that leaders have a responsibility to seek a variety of perspectives, to expand our point of view, and to make as many decisions, not based on what's comfortable for us, but based on what's going to do the most good for the most people as much of the time as possible. I think those are the leaders we all want to follow, right? The ones that will at least take into account how their decisions will affect us. Even if they can't make the best decision for us all the time, they've at least weighed those, you know, weighed those impacts in their decision. And I think if those are the kinds of leaders that we want to follow, those are the kinds of leaders we should all strive to be. So I want to challenge each of you to think about what kind of leader do you want to be and how can you possibly be an effective leader if you're not willing to expand your point of view, to reach out, to think about things from different perspectives and to make the best decisions for the most people as much of the time as possible. Now, your biases are going to get in the way of that and you can't undo it. Sorry, but there are three things you can do to help move beyond, to disrupt or interrupt these auto response uh, paths, patterns that you have in your behaviors and in your, you know, in your brain, uh, in your neural pathways, that you actually can interrupt these default patterns and do something different. Choose bigger. And the first step in that is to notice your own response. So when you're in a situation where you're meeting someone new or you're hiring a candidate for a role on your team or there's a change in your organization in some way, notice how it makes you feel. Now, I know sometimes, especially you know, in some industries, wink, wink, we don't like to talk about feelings. We like to talk about facts and data and numbers, but feelings are very much a part of what drives our interactions with others. And so you have to notice your own feelings first. Notice how your body is responding in the moment. And that's going to clue you into which of those 11 million sensory inputs seemed like a threat a second ago. Okay. And as you're thinking about that, think about, well, what are the values I'm prioritizing that might be making me feel that way? What are the experiences I'm bringing to this moment that are driving those feelings? And most importantly, what identity am I trying to protect with those values? Because sometimes it really feels like we're being personally threatened, right? Our status as a quote unquote good person is under attack. And so I would ask you, especially with some of the stuff we're going to discuss today, notice how you're feeling and what does that mean and where does that come from? And try to untangle that a little bit because there's a lot in just the untangling of it, that can allow you to see things in a new way and even see yourself in a new way. Step two is to observe others' responses. Now, I don't know about you, but everywhere I've ever worked, whenever something changes, people tend to have different opinions about it. We don't all agree. And I don't think that's unique to the places I've worked. But you know, every time something changes, every time there's a new stimulus introduced into the environment, The people around us are bringing their experiences and their judgments and values and identities to that moment as well. And we can pick up clues about those things by noticing other people's responses in the moment. And if you see somebody, I bet you're thinking of somebody right now that you work with that no matter what happens, you're on opposite sides of it, right? So if, if, you know, they change the soap dispensers at work um, from liquid soap to foam soap, If you were excited about it, this person was not happy about it and vice versa, right? No matter what the change is. And so, you know, my advice is look to those people whose response is different and ask, what are the experiences that they have? What do they know that you don't? What are the values they're prioritizing? What identities are they protecting? What judgments might they be making about you and your response? And you can file all of those responses away in your brain, kind of like a database. And it's going to become important for step three. 
Step three is Cindy's favorite. It's to press your pause button. Now, your pause button is a physical space on your body. It's that little divot under your nose. It's called your philtrum or medial cleft. You probably have never considered that before unless you had to shave around it, but it's right under your nose. And if you put your finger on your pause button, it does two things. One, it makes it look like you're thinking really hard. And two, it keeps your mouth shut for just a moment. And while your mouth is shut for just a moment, I want you to go back and think about all of the possible responses that you've observed to a situation like the one you're currently facing. And now you can start to think about, well, what's the most productive response right now? And you can make that decision, if you hold your finger there for just a couple moments, you can make that decision not based on 40 bits of information, but maybe 80, 120, 160, 200. And you're starting to make better decisions by gathering more information before you respond. Now, you know, the response won't be the same every time. That's totally okay, right? Your context will change. Your audience will change. You will have changed, hopefully, and grown and gotten a broader perspective the next time you need to respond. And that's the whole point of this is to think it through and to challenge whatever your first thought is. So a lot of times in diversity and inclusion work, You'll hear people say, you're not responsible for your first thought because your first thought is almost, it's almost a reflex, right? You can't help that. But you are responsible for your second thought and your first action. For most of us, our first action is to speak. And how many times have we ever spoken that we wish we could put those words right back? And this will give you the tool. This is the tool to keep that from happening, especially when you're working with people who don't see the world the way you do. Again, I want to remind everyone to use the Q&A feature. If you have questions as we go, I will answer questions at the end. And I just wanted to make sure that I got that out before we move on to the next section. So you came here today to talk about networking, right? How do we, how do we network better? And, you know, the reason I start with the unconscious bias piece is because I want you to realize that what you're doing is not it's not bad, right? It doesn't make you a bad person. It's something that you do without thinking, number one. And number two, it's stuff that you can do differently, but you have to be conscious of it. And so I want you for just a moment, oops, hold on. If you have a sheet of paper in front of you, hopefully you've been taking notes, turn that paper over, you know, grab an index card or your electric bill or whatever you've got on your desk in front of you. And draw a grid like the one that you see in front of you. And while you're doing that, I'm going to tell you a couple things unrelated to this exercise, but related to this exercise. So the first thing I want to tell you is as we go through this, I'm not going to touch on every single thing because I can't in an hour. And, you know, it's people's lives, life's work to get all of this right all of the time. Um, But I want this to be kind of a starter kit for you to think about, you know, What are you doing by default? How can you show up differently? Um, Who's in your network? Where do you need to be more intentional? That's, That's caveat number one. Caveat number two is that I created this assessment and I took it the day I created it and I thought, oh my gosh, this is gonna be so much fun. And I took my own assessment and I was completely mortified by my results. Absolutely embarrassed. But... And here's the but, because you may not like what you see when you get to the end of this, and that's okay. Everything on here is something that I had the power to change in my own life and career. And when I changed what I was doing because of what I saw, everything changed for me for the better. And you have the same power to change anything you don't like and the results you're about to see. So I want to make sure I make those two things very clear up front so that we'll still be friends about halfway through. Okay? All right, so I want to talk to you first about how to network like a champ. CHAMP is an acronym that is to help you help you remind yourself of the five critical connections you need in your career. Now, for each person in your CHAMP network, each category in the CHAMP network, I want you to put down 
the name that comes to mind first, the person that you have the best relationship with, the one that you spoke with most recently um, in each category. So make this a very top of mind activity. You may not have anyone. That's okay. Just leave that one blank. And if you have more than one, just pick one. Okay. So the first category of person you need in your network is a customer. And I'm not talking about an internal customer. I'm talking about somebody outside of your company that pays money for the goods or services your company provides. Now, in my case, my customer's name oops, is Vonda. I talk to her quite a bit. And oh, and this brings up a good point. You can't put the name of a company here. So let's say you're an insurance broker and you work with State Farm. You can't put State Farm. You have to put Jake from State Farm. Okay. So C is for your customer. Now, why do you need to know a customer? Maybe you're not in a customer facing role. Maybe you work in IT or HR or something like that. Well, knowing your customers helps you know what's important. And when you know what's really important and what drives whether or not your company collects actual dollars from the market, you're better able to innovate, you're better able to streamline operations, you're better able to focus on what's important. And just getting closer to customers can make you a leader in your department if nobody else is doing that. So that's a little career tip for you. The second kind of person you need in your network is someone you've hired or helped get a job. So if you are a hiring manager, this is easy. Just write down the name of the last person you hired. If you are not a hiring manager, think about who in the last couple of months have you sent a job, an open job posting to and, and encouraged them to apply? Who have you vouched for at your company? Who have you uh, written a LinkedIn recommendation for, written a letter of recommendation, introduced to a hiring manager or a recruiter that you trust? Most of us want a really high value network. And the best way to be to get a high value network is to be of value to our network. And the best way to do that is to help people move forward in their career, especially right now when unemployment is so high, when people have other pressures and, you know, there's a lot, there's a lot going on right now. If you can help somebody, you know, be gainfully employed, get a position that's a better fit for them, move into a promotional opportunity, something like that, they're going to remember you fondly for a long, long time. So C is for customer. H is for hired or helped get a job. A is for your associate. Now, this might be your work best friend, right? Your work buddy. And it may be somebody at your company or somebody somewhere else. And that's okay, too. But this is the person that you call, you know, when you're thinking about switching jobs or you're thinking about, you know, making a move or evaluating your options, kind of a pacing partner or maybe the person you invite out for a drink if things aren't going so well. Most of us have somebody like this in our network. The M is for your mentor. Now, your mentor may be someone who's assigned to you through an association that you belong to. It may be somebody that's assigned that you've been partnered or paired with through some program at work. Or it may just be somebody that you think of as a mentor that you, you know, when they give you career advice, you take notes and make it happen. If the person who was top of mind as your mentor is not someone that was formally assigned to you, but someone that you just think of as a mentor, you know, tell that person how you feel about them and how much you value their expertise and input and guidance. Because a lot of people go their whole lives never knowing, you know, what kind of an impact they're having. And I've found that when someone has a positive impact on me, telling them is a really good way to begin to return that favor. Now, if you don't have someone that you know personally that you think of as a mentor, think about whose books do you read, whose blogs do you follow, whose podcast do you listen to? That person might be your mentor as well, even if it's a very one-sided relationship where you're just consuming all of their ideas and they don't even know you exist. That's okay too. But I'd prefer it if you had one of those first two. The P is for protege. This is someone that you see the potential in, you want to see them succeed, not because it's good for you, but because it's good for them. Somebody that, you know, when they call you for advice, you stop what you're doing and help them. Um, or you make sure that they know in advance 
hey, watch out for this. Don't step here. Talk to this person, right? You're really looking out for them. And so um, it's time for our first poll. I would like to know of the five people in your champ network, how many do you have? So it might be none, one or two, three or four, or all five. And I'm going to click mine and I'm going to see the poll pop up here. Where do the polls pop up? Help, help. They should pop up in front of everyone's screen. Okay. So I saw the take the poll, but I'm not seeing the results. Where do we see those? Um, do you have the poll be Q&A? It's right next to Q&A between there and handouts. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Ah, closed. Okay. So open. Got it. Okay. So polls open. So I see about 5% have nobody in their champ network. That's okay. Um, you know, you've got a little bit more work to do to catch up to the people around you. But think about where can you put yourself in some situations where you can, um, you know, where you can meet some folks. And I know it's tough right now with, you know, us not being able to have meetings in person and, you know, we're not in the office, but think about, you know, LinkedIn or, you know, online meetups or different places that you could go virtually, uh, people that you could connect with that you can learn from. Um, I see a lot of folks in the three or four category. It looks like most people fall in the three or four. And, you know, that's pretty good. Um, still, though, I would encourage you to round this out because you're going to get, if you have all five of these um, slots filled, and not just with one person, but with a whole network of customers, a whole network of people that you've helped get a job, a whole network of associates, right? You're going to see a lot of things you never saw before about your job, your career, your company, your industry, and what's possible. And it'll give you a good 360 degree view. To the 21% of you who have all five, awesome, keep going. Um, we cannot stop. And I would even advise you, you know, this will change over time. I try to assess my network every couple of weeks. Um, and then certainly, you know, every time I have one of these, I try to, uh, at one of these presentations, I try to get, you know, a fairly recent version of this up so I can hold myself accountable. Am I really connecting with people, um, in these categories? Am I reaching out? Am I looking out for folks? And am, am I making sure other people are looking out for me? And, you know, it makes a big difference just to track who am I connected with? Okay, so now that you know who's in your champ network, I want to talk about what perspectives does your network ignore? And this is where the unconscious bias piece comes in. In the I column, put an X next to anyone who's in a different industry than you. So if you are, you know, if you're in the um, insurance industry, you would put every, put an X next to anyone who's not, excuse me, in insurance. If you're in healthcare, you would put an X next to anyone who's not in healthcare. Um, and it's time for our second poll. Our second poll is how many of your champs are in a different industry? I will select three or four and submit. And I'm always curious to see this. So typically when I have an audience with people who have quite a bit of tenure in their careers, let's say, um, they will have four or five people in their champ network that come readily to mind, usually all five. Um, and they're feeling pretty good about themselves until I ask, well, how many of them are in a different industry? And then we see those numbers shift a little bit because <laughs> we tend to get in our own echo chamber. So um, I'm seeing the bulk of folks only have one or two people. Um, about 55% of you have one or two people outside of your industry. And a third of you don't have anyone. And you know, this is important to know because whatever is going on in your industry right now has already happened somewhere else. Those problems have already been addressed. They've been solved in different ways. And whatever your industry is doing right now is something, a product or service that you can sell to someone else. So if we never get outside of our own industry, it's really hard to innovate, but it's also really hard to create new markets or to tap into existing markets. So I would encourage you to find a way to connect with people outside of your industry. One great way to do that is in a Toastmasters organization, Toastmasters Club. 
um, because you'll get, you know, if you go into your community, you'll find people from all different um, professional backgrounds there. Um, but there's so many ways to do this. And I cover all of that in the book. Okay. The next one is put an X in the first G column next to anyone who is in a different generation than you. And for the purposes of today, just an X next to anyone who's at least 10 years older or 10 years younger than you. I'll give you a second to do that. And then I will ask for our final poll. How many do you have in a different generation? Now, it's important that we connect with people um, across different generations. And I'm a Gen Xer. And if you're a Gen Xer, this is your moment. This is the only time that's ever going to come in handy because you've got people in the workforce who are more than 10 years older than you and people in the workforce who are more than 10 years younger than you. And all the rest of the time being a Gen Xer kind of sucks. But right now is our time. So, <laughs> you know, it's important to connect with people who have more tenure in your organization or in your industry because they see cycles where you might not and they can take a longer view of things and they can put things into perspective and into context. Similarly, though, it's really important that we all connect with people younger than us, people who are just entering the workforce or who maybe even aren't there yet, because the way they want to interact with the products and services they consume is vastly different than anything that's ever come before. And if we lose touch up with how the economy is changing and how customer expectations are changing and how employee expectations are changing, we're going to find ourselves very quickly obsolete. And it looks like in this group, we have quite a bit of work to do in this space as well, because um, six, 59 percent of us only have one or two people that we're connected with, closely connected with from a different generation. So I'm going to challenge those of you who have, you know, fewer than three to really do some work on this because it's important. Even if you're brand new in your career, even if you just graduated college last week, you know, there are still people in college who could use some assistance. There are people who, you know, are five minutes behind you uh, who don't know how to fill out a job application, don't know how to put together a resume, whatever the case may be. Anything, you know, any skill you've learned is something you can help someone else master and it'll really help you you know, not only help them, but it'll help you understand their perspective as well. Now, I'm not going to ask you to share any more with me because some of the stuff that we're going to get into is a little more sensitive. But the next G is for people with a different gender identity than you. And so what I mean by gender identity, let me give you an example. I'm a cisgender woman. And what that means is when I was born, the doctor said it's a girl and they were right. But that's not everyone's experience. So I would put an X next to anyone who is a man, a transgender woman, or a non-binary individual. Now, why is it important for me to network with men? Well, in the Fortune 500, 96% of CEOs are men. 94%. Somewhere in there. High 90s. <laughs> High to mid 90s. So, you know, most C-suites are comprised mostly of men. Most senior leadership teams are comprised mostly of men. And anywhere that I've ever worked, when I've talked to men in positions of power about my experience as a woman in their workplace, they've been surprised by some of the things that I've seen that they had not ever seen before or heard before. Um, and in some cases, they were not so thrilled about some of those things. Um, and in other cases, they didn't believe me, but that's a topic for another day. Now, if I'm not sharing my experience as a woman in their organization, they're not likely to hear it because they're probably mostly networked with men, but also they've not lived my experience and they don't know what that looks like. Similarly, though, if I want access to those budgets, right, if I want access to those decision makers, I need to make sure that they're in my network. And I need to have good, trusting relationships with those folks. So it benefits me and it benefits them. And just like I want men to be able to advocate for me when I'm not in the room, I need to be there to advocate for my trans and non-binary colleagues and friends. Why? Because they have a hard time getting a seat at the table too. Um, you know, if I didn't have trans and non-binary people in my network, I wouldn't know things like 
trans women are four times more likely to live in extreme poverty because if their gender presentation doesn't match their gender markers on their state issued ID, that makes for uncomfortable conversations and discrimination in the hiring process. It's also very uncomfortable for them to leave the house a lot of times because they don't know if they'll be allowed to use public restrooms or if they'll be harassed or even physically assaulted for doing so. Um, I wouldn't know things like trans women of color and black trans women in particular face the highest murder rates and incarceration rates of any segment of our society because of the triple threat of racism, sexism, and transphobia and the way they're perceived in public. I also wouldn't know that non-binary individuals face the highest suicide rates of any group in our nation because they're frequently told that they don't exist on official forms, in conversations, and, you know, in general, they're typically erased. And so if it's hard for folks to get into our companies, right, it's going to be even harder for them to get to a place where they can help make policy decisions or influence policy decisions that make it easier for them to survive and thrive there. And if they can't get to the table to make those decisions or influence those decisions, it's going to be continue to be hard for them to get in the door. So I need to be able to advocate for people who don't have a voice yet and make sure that they have access. The N in IGNORE stands for native language or national origin. I don't have any in this category this week. I'm a little embarrassed by that, but I wanted to make sure that I was transparent and honest with you. <laughs> this is an area that I struggle. I struggle to put myself in situations where I'm, um, you know, more likely to meet people who are from other countries or who have different native languages than myself. And one of the things that I've benefited from with those relationships that I do have is that, you know, it's really difficult to see your culture and your assumptions that you're making until you see it through a lens of someone outside. It's kind of like when someone comes over to your house, you start to notice how messy your house is, right? Like before it looked clean, but then somebody stops by and you're like, oh my gosh, this place is a mess. It's kind of the same thing. When you see your culture through new eyes, when you see your assumptions through new eyes, it helps you understand, you know, sort of those things that you take for granted or that you assume are universally true and they aren't. The O in ignore stands for sexual orientation different from yours. Now, a lot of times I will, um, I, folks will tell me, well, you know, that's none of my business. Okay. Um, and then I usually ask, well, do you have a picture of your family on your desk at work? Now, this was back when we went to work, right? <laughs> All those months ago when we actually went to work. And they say, well, of course I have a picture of my family on my desk. Well, a lot of my friends and colleagues have been afraid for a very long time to put pictures of their family on their desks because they might be ostracized by their teams. They might be, you know, it might be held against them by their manager. It might result in them losing their jobs. And in fact, it was only just a few weeks ago that the Supreme Court decided that it was not legal to fire someone based on their sexual orientation or gender presentation. So, you know, there are very real consequences um, or have been very real consequences for people um, you know, for being out at work. And the other thing I hear a lot is that people say, well, I don't have a problem with people who are LGBTQ, lesbian, gay, bisexual, or transgender, or queer, but I don't know anybody like that at work. And to them, I say, well, <laughs> half of people from the LGBTQ community are not out at work for all of those reasons previously listed. And it's not that you don't work with them, it's that they don't feel comfortable letting you know that you work with them. And so I'm not advocating that you reach out to everybody that you work with and say, hey, I've never asked you what's your gender identity and sexual orientation. That would probably get you a trip to HR. What I'm asking you to do is pay attention when people seem to distance themselves from conversations about what they did over the weekend or when people, you know, kind of shut down. They don't they're not really open with you at work. Ask yourself, not them, but ask yourself, is there anything I'm doing that may make them feel like they needed to be guarded around me? Because I guarantee you folks who are other in the workplace are looking for allies. And it can be something as simple as 
you know, when you talk about your brother and his husband coming over for the weekend, not saying it in a hushed tone, something just as simple as that can make a huge difference. The R stands for race or ethnicity different from yours. Now, in the United States, boy, do we have history here, but we have 400 years of history about who can own property and where, and even for 250 some years, who could be property in this country. And after 400 years of these laws, we live in a pretty segregated society, whether we want to admit it or not, segregated by race and ethnicity. And I would bet if you live in any major city, you know which part of town um, you're more likely to find, you know, the authentic taquerias. You probably know where the good soul food is. It's probably in a black neighborhood. You probably have a Chinatown. You may have an Indian enclave in your, you know, in your city. You know where these parts of town are. Why? Because we're segregated by race and ethnicity. Um, because of this, though, our com because our communities are segregated, so are our schools and our churches. And we don't interact very much with people who don't look like us. And in fact, work is the place we're most likely to do so. So if you're not doing this at work, you're probably not doing it at all. The research that I have that's the most current, um, it was from 2013. There was a study done um, that found that 75% of white people don't have a black friend. And 65% of black people don't have a white friend. And, you know, what, what I've gleaned from that is that about 75% of white people are lying about having a black friend. But, you know, we really don't interact with people very often if they don't live near us, go to our schools, go to our churches, um, or exist in our workplaces. And when you work in a place where there are not very many people who are, you know, of a different racial or ethnic background, um, other than white, you know, they're likely to be an only. And a lot of my friends and colleagues that I talk to have the experience, who are uh, black or brown folks, have the experience of being the only and say, you know, it really sucks because well-meaning white people don't want to talk to me. They're afraid that they'll say the wrong thing. Now, if well-meaning people don't want to say the wrong thing, who does that leave talking to these folks? You know, it's incumbent upon all of us to make sure that, you know, the culture of our organization is consistent regardless of what our employees look like. And if someone's having a completely different experience with the culture of your organization because of the interactions that they are or are not having, make it your job to make that right. Finally, the E in ignore is for an exchange of stories. Now, CHAMP is all about the depth of your network. And the first six letters of ignore is all about the breadth of your network. The E, though, is for the depth of your relationships. For each person in your network, put an X next to their name. If you've had the kind of conversations that, you know, you know about the defining moments in their lives and they know about times when you've struggled and vice versa, because it's the relationships that we build through stories that we maintain over time. Stories build trust, trust builds relationships and relationships make or break careers. And that's what networking is all about. The more stories we tell, the quicker we can connect across difference because it builds trust. There's actually a chemical response in our brains that activates our empathy and our trust when we start sharing our stories with each other. One of the best ways to do that, and again, please put your questions in the Q&A if you have them because we're about wrapping up. Um, one of the best ways to get those stories and to build trust is to ask people, when do you feel included? And if you have time today, if you're working with somebody, if there's someone new on your team or someone that, you know, you're inviting into your space in some way, a customer, a client, a new team member, an intern, a college student, anybody, ask them, you know, I'm so glad you're here. How can I help you feel included? Or what would make you feel included here? And then do that thing. I feel included when people pronounce my last name correctly. And if you know, if you've ever had a hard to pronounce last name and Cindy, thank you so much for asking in advance how to pronounce my name. I greatly appreciate that because it lets me know that, you know, that that was important to you and that I matter to you. And, you know, I've been in situations where that wasn't the case and it hurt. It stung. But ask folks, you know, 
how do you, you know, when do you feel included? Because it's going to be different for everybody. Not everybody has the same struggles. And even people who have the same struggles, for example, as a working mother, I love it when people ask to see pictures of my kids, but not every mom wants to cart pictures of their kids around at work, right? So I get that, right? We're all different and we all want to be included in a way that's personal and unique to us. And you'll only know if you ask, but this is a great icebreaker and it's a great way to get to know people at a deeper level in your organization. Okay. If you would like more information about this, I have a free book. It's called 21 Insights for Inclusive Networking. And you can get it by completing the survey at NBB for Network Beyond Bias, nbbsurvey.com. Um, you answer a couple of questions, give me your email address, I'll send you a free ebook. Um, you will get valuable information for your organization and your career. And you can unsubscribe and break my heart at any time after you get your book. No questions asked. Um, but that's an offer that I have for you today. And I want you to imagine that on the other side of this, <laughs> this forced enclosure that we're all in right now, right? This, this forced being at home and being distanced from one another. There's something on the other side of this. And what's on the other side of this is a world where we can all give our best effort, realize our potential, and connect with each other on a human level and really understand each other better. That's the kind of world I want to live in. That's the kind of world I want to invite you into. If you want to be a leader in that world, I would love for you to schedule some time with me at leadwithamy.com and we can talk about how we might work together a little bit more and dig into some of these, um, some of these topics a little deeper and a little bit more intentionally. But for now, to close us, I want you to imagine for a moment that you've got a hula hoop. Sit up really straight in your chair or stand up if you want to. I'm doing this. I hope you can hear in my voice that I'm doing this. And put your hands out to your sides as if you were holding a hula hoop around you. The website for the free ebook is nbbsurvey.com, nancyboyboysurvey.com. Hold your hands out to your sides as if you had a hula hoop around you. This is like an Amy Cuddy power pose. Now, a lot of times when we talk about diversity and inclusion, we get overwhelmed because we think, well, I don't control company policy. I don't control, you know, all of the systemic problems of racism and sexism and transphobia and homophobia and ableism and all of these other things, right? I, I don't have any power over all of that. But I want you to realize that you do have power over what happens inside that hula hoop that's around you right now. You can make that space an inclusive one. And you can take that space with you anywhere you go, anywhere you move your feet. When people see that, when people see you being inclusive and making decisions as an inclusive leader, they will be drawn to you. Your influence will expand and that circle will get bigger. But it all starts with what you do in that circle and who you invite into it. It matters who's in your inner circle. It matters how we treat each other. And you have the power to control that. Thank you all so much for your time. All right. Wow. Thanks, Amy. I, I have to admit that was even better the second time. And I was able to fill in some of the gaps in the notes that I was taking um, back in September when you spoke for sight. Um, thank you so much. I think it's great to think about the, the diversity of your network without feeling weird or embarrassed about it and instead having some real tools to not only evaluate it and do that little grid, but also, you know, understand that there's things that you can do um, differently going forward. I, whenever I get in front of HR, I've made it a, a point to point out that organizations, whether it's a church or a school or a, or a company, is improved when you have a wide amount of diversity in the members. And that, um, you know, and that includes diversity in age, race, gender, and ability. I mean, all of those things um, count. So I just want to thank you so much for giving us so much to think about. Um, and here's my PSA. So this webinar has been recorded and will be posted to the Site of Foundation YouTube channel in the next couple of weeks. 
Amy's contact information is available in the webinar invite, so be sure to reach out to her if you've got specific or private questions you might have, or if you feel your firm would benefit from hearing more from Amy on this topic. You will be receiving a post-webinar survey in your inbox, so be sure to fill that out and provide candid feedback that will help us improve. Um, the Silo Foundation provides these webinars free of charge as part of our mission and outreach. So if you learned something of value today, please do consider a personal or corporate donation to the foundation. We rely on donations to keep programs like these webinars going. And last, I'm going to send out another thank you to Examifax for supporting the Silo Foundation and sponsoring today's webinar. I sure hope to see all of you again next month. We will be having a panel of experts discussing living that post-COVID COVID insurance life, and that's on September 17th. So please add that to your calendars and plan to join us then. In the meantime, stay safe. And thanks again, Amy, for joining us today.